Let's start by opening the workbench. The first time you run the workbench, it shows a welcome screen that provides shortcuts to documentation and much more. Click here to access the list of samples. At the end of the list, in the Fun section, is the soundboard sample. To open it, just click on its name. The soundboard project will load into the workbench. Once opened, the project is automatically compiled. Before we try it out, let's have a look at the UI. Several panels are available, including the device list here. It lists all available devices and features filters, family definitions and updates from our central device database. Next panel is the service browser, here. This panel shows all files and folder structure of the open project, from pictures and libraries to source files. Next interesting panel is the servers panel, here. For now, it only contains the emulator, which is a local instance of the publishing server, but we'll see a bit later how to use it. Let's go back to the most important one, the service desk, here. This one provides access to all source code, libraries, resource files, adaptation framework and components used in the current project. Let's focus back on the service desk, starting with having a look at the source files. As we can see here, source files are split between client and server. Basically, code positioned on the client will run on the device, while the server ones will be processed first by the server on demand before being sent to the device for execution. As I just shown, moving a section of code from server to client, or the other way around, is as simple as a drag and drop. The project checks the dependencies and recompiles accordingly. Now, let's have a look at libraries. Libraries can be of three types client, server, or script. Client and server are similar and are simple jar files that can be utilized from Java snippets within the application code. Script libraries allow developers to build reusable blocks of codes using Stromezzo's instance script pure client language. As we can see here, Java libraries can be classic ones for XML parsing or JDBC drivers, for instance, or any custom ones to integrate with legacy systems or third parties. Let's have a quick look at project resources. In the same way, resources can be on the client or on the server. They can be organized in folders and usually are media assets or properties files. Components are code blocks ready to be integrated to enable Zeus developers to build mobile applications as quickly as possible. They cover most UI widgets required to build a modern application and interface with our adaptation framework to fit most devices' look and feel. Let's focus now on a key component of device abstraction, the adaptation framework. In this section of the service desk, we can find all the information, properties and logic on how our application will behave on different screen sizes and shapes both globally and screen per screen. Let's have a look at this screen layout. As you can see, a screen layout is a simple XML file that defines UI containers and subcontainers, identifying them and describing their behaviors. Going one step further, we can visualize the layout by using the layout preview panel here. The layout now appears even more clearly, allowing fast trial and error adjustments. Let's see this in action by changing the margin value here. Looking better now, I think. We can easily visualize the effect here. Now, let's see how other screen sizes behave with this layout. Let's pick up a landscape-oriented screen. We can now see how our application will adapt to such a resolution. Device abstraction-based applications are coded using a simple XML-based language. It mixes XML and script for UI and interactions management and Java snippets for business logic and all backend related actions. Let's have a look at this source file. As you can see, the editor uses syntax highlighting 
and I'm going to show you it supports also code completion both for XML and Java code. I'm here adding an item in the XML section and you can see the code completion working well. Let's remove that. Now go to Java section and add some code. Again, you can see the code completion fully working, allowing for easy and efficient coding. Almost done here. Every time I save, the project is compiled again. Now that we've seen a bit of code, let's have a look at the result by running the emulator. To run your project in the integrated emulator, just click on the emulation button there. Now, we need to select a couple of devices on which we're going to emulate the service. Selecting the Galaxy S, and I'm using the filtering from the device list to get a landscape device, a Windows 1, the Blackjack 2. It's done. The service compiles again, runs a uh, local copy on the server side, and will soon start the emulator. That's it. So this is the emulator running the application we've been loading since the beginning. We can see that uh, there's two devices that we emulate behave in a very differently. Uh, the first one has a focus, and you have to press fire to trigger the noise. On the other hand, the Galaxy S is a touchscreen device and therefore has no keyboard focus and triggers the sound by just tapping on it. Now, I can now choose what devices I want an install file to be generated for. I'll keep the two we emulated earlier as my selection. Part of the publication process features the customization of the provisioning site. This web page will host the generated install files and allow users to directly go there and download the application for their mobile. Let's change the welcome text a bit and then press finish. The project is getting published now. We can see the progress by clicking here. Once the server part of the project is published, clients for the selected devices are generated. We can see the progress here too. Generated clients have been published on the provisioning site, but are also stored on your computer for later use. Let's see them. We can see the folder structure that has